Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so happy to see you. Um, my name is Susan Bollendorf, and I'm president of Chevy Chase Historical Society. We're very happy to present this program called Preserving Your Precious Memories at Home. Hopefully, you'll get some tips and ideas for how to take care of family photos, family papers, those sorts of things. I, I know we all have them, and uh, some of us don't have them in the best condition that we, we aren't keeping them in the best condition that we should. Renata Lazowski is our director, and she will be presenting this um, event, and uh, I hope she has, I know she has a lot to share with us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Renata Lasowski. It's so great to have you here today. It's a beautiful day. You could have been doing basically anything else, but instead you came here for this talk and I'm so appreciative of that. As Susan had said, the name of this presentation is Preserving Your Precious Items at Home. And the goal of this presentation is to provide you with information so that you feel empowered to preserve your own collections at home. And the way that we're going to achieve this is helping you understand risk factors for your collections and the ways that you can mitigate that risk, uh, bad, better, and best practices for preservation. And then we'll go over some case studies for common preservation problems that you might encounter with the objects you have at home. So we'll look at family documents, photo albums, scrapbooks, newspapers, and also digital resources. So these are the main damages to your items. These are your main risk factors. Light, moisture, metal, acidity, adhesives, poor storage, and excess handling. Light is pretty self-explanatory. Light is bad for our skin, ultraviolet light. It's bad for your paintings, it's bad for your documents, and it's bad for your objects. Um, moisture also can cause mold. Metals can cause corrosion, which can damage papers. Acidity is actually baked into a lot of papers, which causes damage over time. Adhesives also have acidity. And then of course, poor storage in poor containers or poor locations, and also handling your items too much or too roughly can cause damage. So two main things to consider when you are looking at preserving your collections are your needs and the cost that you want to invest into preserving your collections. So as far as your needs are concerned, you want to look at the level of protection that you wish to achieve. And your preservation needs are going to be dependent on very many variables. The first thing that you really want to ask yourself is, are your items in need of short-term preservation or long-term preservation? And also you would like to ask, are your items damaged by mold or moisture? And do they need any kind of emergency intervention? So this presentation is going to focus mostly on that first question, which is the short-term and long-term preservation. If you have items that have been badly damaged either by mold or by rips and tears that you can't fix on your own, you might want to consider taking them to a document conservator. Um, also, the cost is something that you want to consider. You don't need to spend a fortune on archival materials to do this, um, but there are ma very many uh, suppliers like Gaylord Archival, Hollinger Metal Edge, Brodart Library Supplies, and they all sell high quality, quality materials. I'll be talking mostly about products from Gaylord just because that's what we use in our office at Chevy Chase Historical Society. And the good news is that you can actually buy some archival safe products in your regular stores, big box retailers, Amazon, or even craft stores. So why should you consider using archival products? Well, archival products have very specific material properties that make them safe for your documents and your photographs and your objects. 
And this image that we have on the screen is the same that you received when you came in today, this kind of puzzle piece item. This is from Gaylord Archival, and it explains the different material properties that you want to look for when you're purchasing archival supplies to store your collections. They say that acid-free is just one part of the preservation puzzle. So I'm going to go through a few of the different puzzle pieces that I think are the most relevant for what you probably deal with at home with your collections. So those are acid-free, lignin-free, buffered material, the photographic activity test, inert plastics, safe adhesives, layers of protection, and design and construction. The first and probably the most well-known our archival term that maybe you've heard of is acid-free. Acid-free gets talked about all the time when you talk about archival products. Paper becomes acidic during the manufacturing process, which causes it to become yellow and brittle. And acid-free is essential for mitigating that deterioration. When you are purchasing archival products, you always want to make sure that they're labeled acid-free. You don't want it to say archival quality. That doesn't mean anything about the material properties of the product. It should say acid-free. And there's a convenient way to test if your materials are acid-free, which is a pH testing pen. From where you are, it just looks like a regular uh, felt tip pen. But these are very nice because they will actually turn yellow or purple. So if you can see, this is purple. So it's actually saying that this is acid-free paper. This is actually printer paper. Not all printer paper is acid-free though, and just because it starts acid-free doesn't mean it won't become acidic over time. So you do like to have these, or we like to have them at the office just so that we can check if the material we have is acid-free or not. Another component that you don't want inside of your archival materials is lignin. So lignin is an organic compound which is found in plant stems. It's actually what gives plants their rigidity. And this needs to be specifically removed from paper products in order to remove that acid. When you buy archival products, you should look specifically that it says lignin-free, just like acid-free. And it's not completely lignin-free. It's next to impossible to remove all of the lignin from cellulose-based products. But archival materials will have less than 1%, so it is a trace amount of lignin. Something else you'll frequently hear about is buffered materials. Buffer paper gets talked about a lot in the archival context. And buffered materials are materials that actually contain an alkaline substance. So instead of being acidic or neutral, they're actually alkaline. And so this makes it almost a little bit sacrificial. It's going to actually absorb that acid and prevent it from migrating between items. You should use buffered papers whenever you have cellulose-based items. So that's your regular standard paper, but also anything with cotton, flax, linen, or jute, and it's going to protect from acid migration. You don't always want to use buffer paper, though. If you're dealing with anything that's protein-based, such as leather, wool, silk, or pearls, you don't want, you want to use unbuffered paper. This also goes for blueprints, albumin prints, and cyanotypes. If they come in contact with the alkaline materials, they can become damaged. So the next item is the photographic activity test. And this tests for possible interactions between photographs and whatever material they're in prolonged contact with. The chemicals that are used to develop photographs are very sensitive to other kinds of chemicals, so it is very important that you use items that pass the photographic activity test. I have, well, as an example, to go back to buffers, um, this just looks like regular standard paper. This is actually buffered paper. It is uh, neutral paper that you can use to interleave to protect items. There's also tissue papers that you can use that are buffered. And then for the photographic activity test, there's all kinds of different sheets and envelopes that you can purchase for different sizes. For example, these are actually for your photo negatives to keep your negatives safe. And they come in all sizes in coated paper and also plastics.
And on the topic of plastics, you should only use plastics that are stable and safe for preservation. Archival polyester, also known as PET or mylar, is a clear, strong, and rigid material. There's also polypropylene, which is heat resistant and protects against moisture, and polyethylene, which is safe, but it's a little bit, I'm sorry, excuse me, it's a little bit more affordable, so it's not as high quality as PET, for example. And I have some examples of what mylar looks like. It's clear, so it might be a little bit hard to see, but it comes in all different kinds of sizes. This is a legal folder. We also have letter, eight by 10, and even small little clear photo slips. These are really nice because of course with photographs, you wanna be able to see them. You don't wanna have them in an opaque folder necessarily if you wanna be able to look at them. And one big no-no when it comes to dealing with your archival supplies is using PVC, anything that's poly polyvinyl chloride. This is also known as vinyl, which is very damaging for your artifacts. Um, a good way to determine if what you're dealing with is vinyl is to literally do the smell test. If it smells a little bit plasticky, I think we all know that plasticky smell, then it's probably PVC. And that smell is actually off-gassing, which means that the material is already degrading. So if you smell that, it means that damage is already occurring within that plastic. Also important is that we use safe adhesives, which will mean pH neutral adhesives. Uh, many tapes and glues have harmful chemicals. Again, with the smell test, you can probably guess which glues have harmful chemicals in them just based on the way that they smell. Um, there's also lots of tapes, like this tape from Gaylord, which you could use for minor repairs on papers or books or photographs, and it is uh, made of inert plastic. Or you can also get this type of PVA glue, polyvinyl acid glue. I actually bought this from a craft store. So you don't have to go to an archival supplier. In fact, I checked and it's by the same production company that Gaylord uses. So Gaylord purchases glue from this company and then they sell it on their website. You can go down to Joanne Fabrics and get yourself a bottle of this. Also very important is that you use many layers of protection with your objects. The more layers that you have, the more protected your items are going to be. And so this tends to include using buffer paper between items, storing your items within folders to keep them rigid and flat, and using boxes to keep them organized and also keep them clean and free of dust. So I have Several examples of folders. The sky is the limit when it comes to archival folders. Pretty much any shape or size that you're looking for, you can probably get. The most common are just regular front enclosure folders. You can get them in letter and legal. Basically, everything is going to come in letter and legal because most of the time, that's the size of documents you're going to be dealing with. You can also get hanging folders. Maybe you're a person who likes to use uh, filing cabinets. We have filing cabinets in our office and we double up actually when in our filing cabinets. So we'll have a hanging folder and then inside of it, we'll have one of our standard folders and then items inside interleave with buffer paper. These are actually my favorite kinds of folders. They're expandable folders. So maybe you have a lot of documents and you don't necessarily need to keep them all individually in you know, singular little folders. You can keep a lot of documents stored fairly safely inside of a folder like this, again, in legal and letter. But of course, not everything is legal and letter sized. Um, these are pamphlet folders. And these are great if you're a, a collector of small books. These are wonderful because they keep them very secure within multiple flaps. So they'll keep them secure on the bottom and secure on the sides and on the top so that they're not shaking around, moving, getting bent inside of your boxes. What's also nice about these folders and 
most archival folders in general is that they have multiple lines of score marks. And this is very important because sometimes you have items that are a little bit thicker. And you can imagine if you put something that's a little bit thick into a folder that has a thin point, like this one, it's going to bow and get kind of chunky. And you're not really going to want that. But you can use a bone folder like this. Again, this is something you can get at a regular craft store. And you can find where the folds are on the folders. And just push down into the perforated line. And there you have a nice flat bottom on your folder, which is going to sit really nicely inside of your box. And it's going to keep everything from slumping down and getting misshapen and bent inside of your boxes. And when it comes to boxes, um, the design and construction of the boxes are very important because it keeps them sturdy and allows for stackability, which is important for us in our archive because we have limited space. So we like to be able to fit as much in our uh, shelving units as we possibly can. And these are very sturdy. Sometimes you can fit four or five high. Metal edged boxes like this are great. They're extremely sturdy. Um, Hollinger Company is known, they're famous for Hollinger metal edge boxes. You hear that a lot within the industry. So this is a great legal size box. This is a clamshell document box. So this would be something that you would use if you have a lot of items that are maybe a little bit larger or things that you want to store flat, like pieces of artwork or even books or scrapbooks or large scrapbooks like these, like we'll be showing later. And maybe you have more than just documents. Maybe you're a bit of a, an item collector. Maybe you've got a collection of silver spoons from travels or you collect pins or something. So there's also lots of great object boxes like these and it's going to keep your items nice and organized. They come with these great little acid-free containers just to keep everything really neat. And the, just like with the folders, all kinds of sizes, the sky really is the limit. You can even get custom made boxes specifically for your special items. And of course, the most famous and most <laughs> important boxes are the bankers boxes. We love bankers boxes. And what's great about the bankers boxes is that you can get smaller boxes and they'll kind of all fit modularly inside. So you could have some uh, photo boxes in there with some folders, with some uh, object boxes. They're really great organizational units. And they can be stacked, as I said. So that's archival products. But do you have to use archival products? The answer is no, you don't have to use archival products, but it is what's recommended. It's what we use in the archive, but we're an archive. You at home, you're just trying to preserve the items that are most important to you. So I'm going to go through uh, the bad, better, and the best options that you have when you're deciding what you want to do with your collections. So bad is going to be obviously things that we don't recommend that you should look for immediate solutions to change. Better is going to be things that are okay for short-term preservation, maybe just to get the items out of the bad condition until you can decide what you want to do with them. And then there's the best options, which are going to be the long-term preservation options, which are going to look a lot closer to what we do at our archive. So the first big bad is going to be that clear plastic tote. Who in here keeps things in a clear plastic tote? Yeah. I'm guilty of this. I know better and I still do it. It's convenient, right? You can stack them up. Um, they're sturdy, easy to move, and all of that is great. But the big thing about these is they're going to create a microclimate inside of that container. So it might feel like, oh, well, they're plastic. They're going to keep water out. Well, that's true if there's a leak in your house. It's going to keep water from pouring over it. 
But once that humidity level rises inside of the container, it's a lot harder for it to evaporate when there's a lid on it. And this is going to cause mildew and it's going to cause mold growth. So if you have things that are inside of a plastic container like this, the best thing to do is get them out of this kind of plastic container. So your better option is going to be something like this one of these plastic crates you might have some of these in your garage this is the very basket that i keep in my trunk of my car for when i get groceries so that my groceries don't slide around so you might have one of these laying around or you can purchase them very cheaply at basically any kind of big box store and what's great about these they're also stackable and they have vents in them so you're not going to deal with that microclimate being created inside of a plastic container There are some varieties that do have lids. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to go for the best option, that's definitely going to be your archival boxes, like all of the Gaylord boxes that I just showed. Another big bad is paper clips. Paper clips are absolutely terrible for your items. If you have paper clips on your documents, you should remove them as soon as you can. Uh, metal paper clips will corrode over time, and what tends to happen is they'll actually get stuck in your documents and they become very hard to remove. I tend to use um, a little spatula like this to get paper clips off. You don't want to pull on them because you could rip the paper. You also could get tetanus. Um, but with one of these, it's very easy to just put just enough pressure under it to lift them up and slide them off of the paper. So once you remove those paper clips, um, you do have other options. And actually, both of these are really good options. So you have just coated paper clips. They're still metal inside. They still technically can corrode, but they do have that barrier that's at least going to keep the corrosion off of your items. So that would be your better option. You might even have these in your office desk drawer. Your best option is going to be these archival plastic clips. These are my favorite. I really like them because they don't leave indents in your papers and they don't have any tearing uh, properties either. They just work really very well, and they're made of an inert plastic. You can buy them from Gaylord. Another option, which is a, an excellent option, is stainless steel paper clips. However, they're prohibitively expensive, so we don't use them in the archive. Another big bad is rubber bands. <laughs> I'm sure many of us have probably encountered a rubber band that was past its age of use and it snapped or it got really weird and stretchy or you realize it started to melt. Well, this happens all the time and it will happen on your archive or your materials as well. Whenever we receive items in the archive wrapped up in rubber bands, we remove them right away. If we're lucky, we can remove them. Sometimes we're unlucky and they actually melt and get stuck onto the item. So, no more rubber bands going forward. Um, and once you remove those rubber bands, um, you have a, a better option. So these Velcro straps that I've shown here, this might be something you've got in your junk drawer at home. I feel like every time I get a new electronic, I have one of these little Velcro straps wrapped around the cords. Um, so if you have a lot of posters that are rolled up and maybe you've got them in rubber bands, switch them out for a Velcro strap in the meantime until you can get something a little bit better. So your best option is going to be this cotton twill tape. Uh, we use this a lot in the office. Um, typically what I end up using this kind of twill tape for is when we have books that have um, covers that have come off because you can kind of do that four-way wrap, like you're wrapping a Christmas present and it's going to keep everything together and really nice and secure. This is made from, um, it's a cotton twill tape. Um, it's also used in uh, textiles. So if you have some old textiles that are hanging up on hangers, you can sew some of this gently into like the bands or along the shoulders, and it's just gonna add a little bit of extra strength for your items that are hanging up. Okay, and 
Another big bad is sticky photo albums. And we will be spending a bit of time talking about sticky photo albums. Um, who's, who has a sticky photo album at home? That's what I was expecting, pretty much everybody. My baby book is in a sticky photo album, and one of these days I will take care of it to get it out of that sticky album. So these sticky albums are really terrible for your photos. They're going to cause destruction. Typically, they will actually transfer that adhesive onto the backs of your photos, um, and it will cause irreversible damage because you can't remove that adhesive once it's stuck on there. So a better option for your photo albums, though still not recommended, is these standard plastic sleeves. However, most of these are going to be made with PVC, with that plasticky material. So let's say you've got some photo albums and they're in sticky plastic. You should get rid of the sticky ones. That should be your priority. If you have some nice photo albums from the family trip to the Outer Banks and it's in the regular plastic PVC sleeves, it can probably stay there for a little bit while you deal with the other more important ones, but it is good to consider longer term uh, storage for anything that's inside of a PVC plastic insert. And the best option is going to be either using archival folders and buffer paper to store your pictures or using archival uh, photo albums. Uh, like the one that's pictured here. This is actually the same photo kit that is part of our door prize today. So stay after and see if you get picked for the door prize and then you can very quickly start doing your own photo preservation at home. So where should you actually store your items? Well, you should never store them in a basement, an attic, or a garage. I'm seeing some cringes. <laughs> Some people are guilty of this. I think a lot of people are. That's typically where you want to put things to store them. And it is OK if your attic is you know, furnished, if it has um, a good heating and HVAC system. Like that's, that's fine if it's the same as the rest of your house. If there's no difference between the attic or a finished basement or your living room, then that's OK. But anything that doesn't have climate control is not going to be good. So you do want to store your items in an environment that has minimal fluctuations in temperature and humidity. So you want it to be stable, clean, dry, and dark. Stable is really the most important thing though. So if you have a room that's maybe a little bit warmer or a little bit drier, but it tends to always be that way, that's okay. It's just you really don't want things to fluctuate between high humidity and low humidity or being very cold and being very warm. The ideal temperature is going to be 65 degrees with 45% humidity plus or minus 5%. So that's what we keep our archive room set at. And we use an air conditioning system and a dehumidifier system to pull the excess water out of the air. And a good rule of thumb is that if you don't feel comfortable sleeping in that room, then you shouldn't store your precious items in that room. Okay, so now that you've got this information, you think you're ready to get started, what do you need? First thing you're gonna need is clean, dry hands. No lotion. A big occupational hazard for me in the archive is that I can't use lotion on my hands and I have to wash my hands frequently before I deal with artifacts and after I deal with artifacts and I can't use lotion in between. So I get very cracked in the winter time. So you just don't wanna add anything extra onto the objects that you're going to be handling. You can also use gloves. I think these are like the stereotypical archivist, the white cotton gloves. You can also use these kind of like nitrile gloves, but you want them to be non-powdered just to not put any residue on the items that you'll be handling. You'll also want a clean, clutter-free surface, absolutely no food or drinks around. That's just asking for trouble. And you also want to make sure you have a goal in mind, you've, that you've thought about what you want to do. If you get your box of documents out and you actually don't know what you want to do, it might be best to just put the box back, think about what you want to do, because the more you handle the items, the more you take them out and move them around, the more damage that you're going to put them through and the more stress that you're going to put them through. So moving on to our case studies, I think this box probably looks pretty familiar to a lot of people. Um, 
So what we have here is a box of assorted documents in standard folders and a regular old cardboard box. Some of the items are in plastic covers, some of them are in boxes, some are just loose inside of the box floating around. So if you have a box like this, you might want to think about what your options are. Um, as before, I'll go through a better option and a best option. So your better option is going to be to stall any future damage. So the first thing you'll want to do, uh, remove metal staples and remove any paper clips, rubber bands, anything like that. You'll want to flatten any items that are folded. Whenever you have items that are folded and you keep opening up and then refolding them every time you want to look at them or read them, you're just going to put that bend through a lot more stress and over time it's going to cause damage and ripping. So if you could just get the items flat and in folders, that's going to be the best thing to do. Uh, you'll also want to use archival folders at this point if you can. And though you'll use archival folders and buffer paper, you don't necessarily need to go all the way and get the archival box. At least you'll have that first layer of protection to deal with acid migration. Uh, if you get um, acid-free folders and then put them like in one of those plastic slotted boxes, that would be a good option. And one thing that you tend to want to do, or at least we do in the office when we get donations is you like to keep the original order that things were in, especially if these are items you inherited from somebody else. Maybe it's documents from your grandparents. They had them in an order for a reason. And if you break up that order, when you go back to try to understand what all those items mean together, it might be a little bit harder to do. And you should also create a contents list of everything that's in that box, just so that you don't have to go into it and do any kind of excessive handling. This is something we do, we call them finding guides at the archive. So if you have someone who comes in and they wanna learn about something and you know we have a box of things, if you can give them a finding guide, they can look through everything that's in the box without having to pull anything out of the box and then you can take the item for them. It just limits how much you have to touch something. And your best option is of course going to be using all archival materials. So your documents would be stored in archival materials any small objects wrapped in tissue paper and stored in separate containers. And of course, uh, you would also want to keep a contents list just so that you know what's inside of those boxes. This is an example of what we do in the archive. So these are, that photograph is actually items that are on our shelves in the archive. That, so that's how we store them. Uh, what I would suggest doing in a case like this with you, if you have boxes that are full of family documents is kind of doing maybe a little bit of a triage. So take your items that are the most important, the most fragile, and put those into the, the best materials. And then everything else can just go into better storage for the time being. You've probably heard, don't let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, in the archive, we always go for the best, but in, in your home situation, you just have to get them into at least good or better condition and then go from there. Um, th this is something I plan to do this summer, actually. I have a big project of um, things from my grandma. So things from my grandma and my father, they're going to go into those best materials. Things from my college years, souvenirs from my travels, those are just going to go into the, the better options for now. You just have to do what's most important for the collections that you're dealing with. Okay, case study two is the famous sticky albums. So as I said, the sticky photo albums cause irreversible damage. Um, the acidic adhesive transfers to the photos and it's going to make them brittle and discolored. You should remove all photos from sticky albums if possible. Sometimes it's not possible. And in those cases, you may actually want to cut the photos out of that paper. Um, or just removing the pages from the books. But I'm going to show you two ways that you can remove them safely. Um, but before you ever start removing photos from a book like this, you should record the photos that are in the book and you should record the context of the pages. So not just taking a picture of the individual photos, but take a picture of the whole page so that you know what that or original organization was. 
And once you do remove the photos, you should stick them on to a piece of buffer paper because again, they're going to have that sticky residue on the back and they're gonna stick up onto whatever you put them next to. And you should record everything that you know about the photograph, the who, what, when, where, why, any kind of important information because you might know it when you look at it, but when your kids go or your grandkids go to look at it, they're not gonna know who these people are, what these places are. So record that information for them. Okay, so the first method is the spatula method. Um, these are very handy little tools. You can use them for a lot. Um, this one has a squared edge and a rounded edge. You would want to use the rounded edges just because you don't want to poke through any photographs. So when you use a spatula, you'll want to gently slide the spatula between the photo and the page so that you can loosen it. But you don't ever want to jam or force the photograph up because you could end up damaging it. So. Well, here is a photo album. This is an example where you may not actually be able to get these photos out. So this plastic is really, really stuck on there. Okay, now it's coming a little bit loose. So that's good. Sometimes you'll open up these photo albums and the plastic is gonna fly open and all the pictures are gonna slide right out. That's the best case scenario if you have one of these sticky albums. Uh, if, the, if the sticky is really sticking on there, then it's probably going to stick really hard onto the photos as well. So let's just see. Yeah, these ones are really on there. So I'm surprised that that sticky paper came up at all, actually. But that's okay, because actually, this is the book that I wanted to show you. The the trick. So got the blunt edge. So actually, I should have gloves on. I did not mention this. So whenever you're dealing with photographs, um, you're going to have oils from your hands. No matter how clean your hands are, you're always going to have oils transferring onto the items you're dealing with. And in most documents, that's OK. But with photographs, you really don't want to have uh, greasy little fingerprints on your pictures. So I'm just going around the edges. I'm keeping the tool as flat as I can and seeing if it'll lift. And it looks like I've gotten it most of the way there, but there's a little bit where I can see that it's really stuck on. And I don't want to force it. So I'm going to try the next method, which is the to uh, tooth floss method. So the floss method, um, I know we all have floss at home. Uh, however, you want to make sure that you use unwaxed, unflavored floss for this. So you will have to buy it special if you're planning a big uh, photo album project. So you just want to get a nice big long piece of floss. And you'll want to slide it under the photograph and you'll want to move it side to side, just like if you were flossing your teeth actually. You want to move it side to side. You don't want to pull up and you don't want to drag it. You just kind of kind of rock it back and forth underneath the photo. And of course, a problem with these sticky albums is they always want to go back to being stuck. OK. And I'm just rocking it back and forth. And there it went through. And now this adorable photo of a dog wearing a Hawaiian lei on its neck has been freed from its adhesive prison. Although I am going to set it right back into the book so that our dear donor can go and do this project for herself later. 
So it actually is really simple. You just have to be nice and gentle, and you just don't want to force it. OK, so the next case study is scrapbooks. And I have two different examples of scrapbooks. This is an example that I did not bring in to show you in person, only because it's really fragile. So some scrapbooks are going to be more fragile than others. This one's from the 1930s. Um, when you're dealing with old scrapbooks, you can either take them apart or keep them intact. And it's going to depend a lot on what's important to you and the condition of the item. If you have an old scrapbook and the covers are falling apart and the pages are pulling out and the pictures are popping out, it's probably going to be best to actually remove those items from the book and take the book apart. Um, if you choose to break the book apart, uh, you always want to record the context of the items. You're probably going to want to use photographs. You can do scans if it's possible. If the sheets have already come removed, then you can scan them or you can use photos. You'll want to carefully remove the photos with a spatula or floss or gloves. Well, definitely gloves. Um, and then store everything in acid-free containers. You might even want to keep the entire pages intact if the photos are hard to remove. Um, this example actually used photo corners, so that's great if the scrapbook you have used photo corners because there's not going to be adhesive on the photo, and you can really easily pop those out of the photo corners using the spatula tool. If you decide to keep a scrapbook intact, um, your main objective should be to limit future handling of that object. So uh, just like with the other one, record what you have on the pages. Um, in this case, I would say with photographs and not scans, you can imagine if you keep picking up the book, maybe it's in okay condition when you started, but by the time you flipped it up and down onto the scanner 20 times, your cover could come off. So it's better to just take pictures and record everything. Um, and what you'll want to do is interleave the pages with that tissue paper that I showed, that buffered tissue paper. And that's just going to absorb a little bit of that acid that's coming off between the photos and prevent them from spreading it to the other items. And then you'll want to store it in a protective container box. So the other example for scrapbooks is a newer scrapbook with standardized pages. Um, for these types of scrapbooks, scanning is probably okay because they're not going to fall apart on you. You can probably pull the pages right out of the sleeves and scan them. And something that you can do in this type of a situation as well is use that pH pen and test and see if that paper is acidic. Because maybe you're lucky and you bought an acid-free paper and you didn't know it when you put your scrapbook together. Um, and then you can decide, you know, if it's coming up as being highly acidic paper, you may want to remove your photos if the paper is highly acidic, because then you know that more damage is going to occur the longer you keep them on the paper. Um, something else you can do is you can transfer them into the uh, PVA or Mylar sheets. Um, they make them specifically for uh, scrapbooks. You can get them for three ring binders in the 12 inch by 12 inch standard size. So you can really use good archival materials. Um, and a recommendation would be if you're a scrapbooker, when you make a scrapbook in the future, you should just start with using acid free paper and pH neutral adhesives. Um, try using photo corners so that you don't have to put any glue onto your images. And also a great thing to do if you're doing scrapbooks is just don't use originals. If you're going to put photos in a scrapbook, maybe use a copy. Or if you're putting newspaper clippings inside the scrapbook, make copies on acid-free paper and use those instead of the originals. And for this scrapbook, I did bring in a newer one. So this page spread is actually a pretty good example of the type of thing that you'll want to be aware of when you're dealing with these scrapbooks. It has this metal chain in it. It might be a stainless steel chain, but you don't know that until it starts corroding. Also, newspapers start to get yellow. I'm sure we've all seen newspapers get yellow. Um, these newspapers are going to begin getting yellow. 
and something like this um, would probably be worth just making copies of and replacing it because that acid that's in there is just going to transfer into the page and to everything that's on the back. So on the topic of newspaper, this brings us to our final case study. Actually, it's not our final case study. It's our fourth case study. Um, so newsprint is extremely acidic. Um, it's made with lignin. They don't bother going through the extra process to remove lignin from a newspaper. I mean, you chuck it into the trash after a day. It's not high quality paper. And so when that lignin oxidizes, it causes that, that brownish orange color. And that acid is going to transfer between items. So sometimes when it comes to newspapers, you just have to decide, is it worth keeping this newspaper? A lot of newspapers are available online. A lot of newspapers are in archives already. And it just might not be worth keeping around. Um, something that you could do is you could make a copy on acid-free paper and keep that and get rid of the old one. Um, we tend to do that a lot in the archive is make copies of newsprint so that we don't keep a ton of newsprint around. Um, you may want to keep the newspaper though. So what you should do is you should make sure that you can isolate it from other items as best as possible and you'll want to use buffer paper, acid-free folders, or inert plastic sleeves in order to keep them away from other items. So I have an example of a newspaper that I bought when I was in England recently. It's a souvenir newspaper. I was at Eurovision, which is this big song contest thing. And so I wanted to have a little bit of a souvenir, but because I'm an archivist, I know that this newspaper is only going to get browner and browner every single day that goes on. So with this newspaper, um, what I want to do first is actually remove all of the pages in here that I don't want. Anything that doesn't have to do with the reason that I'm keeping the newspaper should just go into the trash because all this is is a bunch of acid that's going to transfer on to the other pieces of paper which are already acidic on their own. So I want to get rid of those. But as I was going through the pages before I was planning to get rid of them, I found there was a little article that was elsewhere in there that was relevant to the event that I was at. So I made a copy on acid-free paper. So I don't need to keep all of that. I don't need to know what the weather was going to be like after I left England. It's not important anymore. But I've got that op-ed in here. So now that those unwanted pages are out, there was also a, a page spread, only one of the page spreads I was interested in keeping. So I simply just cut the paper and got rid of the other page that I didn't want to keep. And then what you could do in a situation like this is you can actually keep all of that newspaper together and slip it right into a mylar sheet. Because of the sizes that they make them, they fit newspapers really very well. Um, so this would be a, a very basic way to do it. Um, if it's a very important newspaper to you and you wanna be a little bit more thorough, you could actually use multiple individual sleeves. But if you were to do that, I would recommend using buffer paper between the pages like that just to keep that acid from migrating back and forth between the pieces and then putting that inside of the mylar and then doing the same for the other items so that you can keep them all separate they're not going to keep passing their acids back and forth to each other and then they're also less handling. You don't have to take them out to read them. You can still see them because it's a clear plastic sheet. And the final case study um, is digital resources. And basically every single one of these case studies, what did I say? Take pictures, make scans, record this, record that. But what do you do with those after you have them? So it's best to have three copies of everything. 
So the first copy that you have is your original. The second copy that you should have is your digital copy. And then your third copy should be a digital copy that's stored in some kind of a cloud service. Um, you should also have a list of the collection that you have. Um, because it's easier to know what you have, you don't have to handle it as much if you know what's inside of your boxes and what is stored on your computer and in your cloud. When you do your digital and cloud-based collections, um, it's important that you create and upload in the highest quality possible because electronic files can degrade over time. Nothing in this world is permanent and digital files feel like they're very permanent to us, but the truth is that they are not. So you wanna start with the highest quality possible. And you should choose a naming convention that works for you. Um, you know how sometimes photographs, you put them in your computer and it'll just be a string of numbers that a lot of times it's actually a date and time notification. Um, but you should choose something that makes sense for you in the collection that you have since you're the one who's going to be using it. So once you choose how you want to name your items so that you can keep track of them, you want to make sure that you stay consistent with those namings between your hard drive or your computer and the cloud. That way there's no confusion. If it says one thing in your computer, it's going to be the same in your cloud and you can easily locate and find everything. And also you should just keep your catalog lists also um, in a hard copy, a digital copy, and a digital copy in your cloud, just in case anything happens, then you've got all your bases covered and you can always recover, at the very least, um, your digital information. And if, if there's any questions. Yeah. So you were just talking about naming conventions, and I'm wondering what you would recommend. Uh, so for your home archives, I would probably recommend, um, like if you have specific boxes, like if you know that everything's in a box, I would maybe name things like B1, box one, and then um, like if you have like a, a topic so that you know what it is, you don't want it to be vague. That's, that's the idea. It, it should describe what those items actually are. It doesn't have to be, you know, photo with Mike and Mindy, you know, on graduation, but it could be family photos or family and then a year that they're from. Um, we have a very complicated system because we're in an archive. Um, so we use accession numbers for our collections, um, but you wouldn't be doing that at home. So it really would be whatever describes the object and makes sense for you and what you have. Are there any papers that are so old they don't have acid? For example, I've got a lot of black photo uh, albums from like 1900. Are the black pages for photos any different in material? Um, so I would guess that they are probably at least a little bit acidic. Um, it's hard though to test because you can't use a pH testing pen on those. Um, you would have to actually dissolve the paper and use testing strips and be very chemistry class about it. Um, but I've noticed that with those black paper photo albums, they don't seem to actually cause too much discoloration. So I, I think there might just have been something about the way that they produced that particular paper. Um, but I, I would say that there aren't papers that have no acid, but there are papers that have less acid, and that is uh, wood pulp paper. So if you're dealing with like cotton rag paper, which would be much, much older paper, that actually does not um, discolor from acid um, because it's made of cotton. This may be a whole different topic, but do you have any thoughts about how to start looking at old movies to see whether they're even there, or could you just ruin them by trying to look at them? And I mean old movies. Like, like, like old, like film. film. Um, My first bite, things like that. 
You know, I would recommend going to a film conservator for that. There are a lot of companies who do services because a lot of people do have film um, and they'll turn it into digital copies for you. Um, I am not very experienced with film. Um, so that would be my recommendation is that's something you want to go to a professional for. Terrific presentation. Yeah. All right. Very the uh, question is, uh, is the uh, Terry Historical Society, are you going to digitize everything at some point? That's a big task, I understand. Most of our collection is digitized. And, and, and B is, it does strike me that there's another lecture lurking here, which is the sort of the next step is once you preserve photo, all photographs and documents, is set at some point for most of us, somewhere in the last decade or so, all our photographs are you know, here. And so the question of, and, and you have documents and other things in various places here. And so the, the, uh, there's sort of a lecture on how do you digitize old stuff, how do you organize it, and what are the digital tools for, uh, for doing this? That is actually an entire specialty within library science right now. There are people who go and do master's degrees specifically for digital resource management, and that actually would be a great um, subject uh, for a talk. Um, and with the digital, with everything being digital now, you almost have to go backwards. So you're starting with digital, and then you should make physical copies, and then those can become your originals. Because like people in my generation, most of our pictures actually aren't originals and I've lost a lot of pictures from my life because they were only ever digital and never got printed and then the camera card gets lost or you drop the camera in the lake when you're you know on vacation and you know bye bye photos um, so yeah you kind of have to work backwards a little bit to make sure that you do have those things backed up from your phone um, you showed the little boxes and said putting mentioned putting things in them you shouldn't put silver in paper ever should you because of the, the sulfur or are those boxes sulfur free as well i don't know about the boxes being sulfur free um you mean like silver like jewelry yeah you know i don't know um typically like the types of objects that we have are things like like pins and buttons um police badges, like the, um, like the cloth kinds that get sewn on. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't actually have an adequate answer. I've never dealt with silver very much. And then also, are all, you, met, you should have a picture of the hard paper clips that were plastic. Are all hard plastic paper clips okay? Um, I would say the only ones that I would know for sure would be okay would be the ones that are sold that, that are labeled that way. Mm -hmm. Probably yes, um, but you might deal with, if, if they're cheaply made, um, degradation, breaking, colors rubbing off from the dyes if the dyes aren't stable onto your items. So just a thought for another lecture. This was perfect. Thank you very much. It's for us to, or for me, to decide where's the line between being archival and responsible and hoarding. <laughs> so here's this box of stuff from grandma. What do you keep and what do you just let go of? I think it is a thin line between all of those things. Uh, I mean, even for us uh, at the office, people come to us with items all the time and you want to be able to keep everything, but the reality is there's only so much space on the shelves and there's only so much space in your not basement or attic, but whatever adequate storage room that you have to keep these things. So you, sometimes you don't need to keep everything. Sometimes it is a good option just to make a copy and have a digital copy and, and that's enough. Um, but really, it's going to come down to what's personal for you and how far you want to take it. 
um, because like I said, you know, you're, you're not an archive, you're an individual. So your needs are a little bit different than what our needs are. So there might be an object for you that is extremely important and sentimental, and you might want to have that in uh, archival folder with a buffer paper, inside of another folder, uh, inside of a plastic. Um, but it might be an item that we maybe wouldn't accept in the archive because it doesn't have value for us, but it has value for you. Um, so it's, it's hard to know, but you just kind of have to maybe straddle the line a little bit and, and see what works. What kind of things do you at the archives um, find have value? Like, are you looking for newspaper articles? Is it, is it, is it photographs, letters? Um, well, we're a mission-based organization, and our mission has to deal with things that are directly related to Chevy Chase. So for us, the highest value items are things that really deal directly with Chevy Chase, with houses of Chevy Chase, general Chevy Chase history, individuals who lived in Chevy Chase. Um, so that's what we consider to be most important. There, there could be items that are extremely important and amazing in a more general sense, but maybe they're not the most important thing for our archive. You had a question? So my mother was very good about storing everything, but she did it all in the same kind of way. There, back maybe 30 or 40 years ago, there were those sort of like plastic, there'd be a plastic folder, and it would be, it would be not an envelope, but it would have two pieces across it and a black paper inside. She would take out the black papers and put everything in those. Do you have any idea of those? What? I'm no, I'm not sure I'm familiar with that okay. type. Um, but if it's if it's with any kind of a paper in a plastic, you should take out the paper and it was clear. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's not like it's not the same kind of soft, um, you know, archival kind of plastic leaves that you get now. Okay, I'll I'll just change everything. <laughs> And sometimes there, there was a period of time where even professional institutions started laminating things. So you might see that occasionally things are coming laminated, which is actually not ideal for your items because those actually can create microclimates and you can't ever get them out. Yeah, there's been a lot of different, different things over time that people have tried and they don't always work out the best. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. That was fantastic.